Good morning, Mountainside. How are you this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there and those joining us online. Happy Mother's Day. We are so glad you've joined us. We invite you to stand as we sing this morning. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun
Well, good morning. What a beautiful day. Uh, welcome to Mountainside. Welcome to those that are online. We're so happy that you could be with us today. Happy Mother's Day. Isn't it a fun day on Facebook when you see all these tributes to moms? And, and uh, what a great thing. I actually found a picture of my mom before I was born. So I was in the picture, but you can't see me. So that was a fun find last night. But uh, welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Um, in a few weeks, we're going to be uh, moving and increasing our capacity because we're moving to a bigger, bigger space. And there are a lot of people that are working very hard to get that space ready. Uh, so it's not just like sitting in a gym for church. It will really... Uh, it will really feel nice, and we're working on the sound and all of those, those things, so uh, uh, a, lot is, a lot is happening. Um, we're going to have Ben come up and give us an announcement. We've got some special things planned. Ben? Thank you. Uh, raise your hand if you were at work day yesterday. There's a few of us out there. Um, I think we talked about how many rocks we picked up yesterday. There were the, thousands or millions of conversations, so I'm not sure where we landed exactly, but there were a lot of rocks picked up. We had a lot of projects done around the property yesterday. About 50 people showed up uh, just to get some different tasks done, whether it was some landscaping, some cleaning up uh, of some areas. Um, we got some painting done. We got some demo done and prep for remodeling of some bathrooms up in the youth center up top. So it was a lot of, uh, a lot of effort. A lot of people came out, and thank you so much for that. Uh, just want to make sure it's on your calendars for this coming weekend uh, for the couples. We're having a couples night. Maybe you've seen it out there on the email, the Mountainside email, connect um, email, or it's also on our webpage as well. Uh, if you haven't, go to that website, click events, sign up for that for this Saturday night. It's from 6 to 8. Um, join us out just for an uh, evening as couples. It's going to be right in here. Um, it's a free event. All you have to do is bring a, a meet for you and your spouse Bring a meet for you and your spouse. Bring your spouse, too. All right? So uh, just make sure you do that. Um, we'll have some grills set up here. We'll take care of all the sides. Um, and, I, again, we just, you know, we get to uh, a privilege to be together as a community in this, in this room, as this church. So it's a joy to come and just hang out together as couples. So take advantage of these opportunities uh, as we have them come about. Um, if you're not... Looking to be part of this, if you can't be part of this event for that night, but maybe you could say, you know, I could, I could uh, kid sit for someone. I could babysit for someone. Reach out to a family that has kids, and maybe uh, could, you could help alongside of that. So please sign up by Thursday. We want to get everything so we can have our food numbers right um, for Saturday night. Again, Saturday night, 6 to 8, right here. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, next Sunday is going to be our quarterly business meeting right at the end of the service. And uh, also, you're aware that uh, we have coming up the Timothy Initiative uh, offering on Pentecost Sunday. Um, and that's coming up quickly, May 23rd. Um, did I give the right day for the business meeting? Is it next Sunday? Okay. My mind just all of a sudden uh, said, I think you said that wrong. But... Uh, Anyway, when uh, I was down at the summit a few weeks ago with the Timothy Initiative, I mean, here is a ministry that has thousands of churches being planted, and the numbers are so big that you wonder, okay, they say they check, but I wonder how thoroughly they check. It just sounds unbelievable. And they were demonstrating their new system, and it was picking a country and then drilling down into that country, into this city, and literally coming up with not only how many churches, but each pastor, the picture of the pastor, the application of the pastor, and the names of the Tituses, and whether or not uh, they were sponsoring um, a widow or orphan. I, I was completely blown away at the extreme level of accountability that the ministry has. Remember I said a few weeks ago, when those churches disbanded as people fled for their lives um, in uh, West Africa, that uh, they had lowered their number 147 because they couldn't locate or hear from 147 churches. So when I give you these numbers for the first quarter of this year, uh, this represents uh, 6,207 churches planted, which means they've received 6,000 207 applications with the pictures of the Timothy that have been approved. Um, 
122,000 new believers in the churches planted and 6,264 widows or orphans um, being impacted by these local churches. We're trying to raise $10,000. We have a, a match for $10,000. Uh, we think we're right around 2,000 of those that have pledged early. Uh, you're welcome to do that. And so you can go right online to our giving and, and uh, click to give just to, uh, to that specific thing. And this will impact and plant churches uh, mostly through the 1040 window as we talked a few weeks ago. Um, but wherever the Timothy Initiative is in those uh, other countries around the world. Is it possible for us to say what church did our money plant because the, the finances are really about uh, training the church planters. No money goes into the specific church uh, to keep that separate and that the church becomes fully indigenous with a tent-making pastor at the head. So that offering is May 23rd, and uh, we thank you for your regular giving your faithful, continuous giving to our general fund, to our missions, and also to our um, uh, generosity fund, that uh, compassion fund. We have been able to impact families uh, on a consistent basis in our community, and uh, it just means a lot. It really speaks highly of our church, and thank you for continuing to fund that account as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us and that you are faithful even when we are faithless but father we thank you for the people of God that support this ministry and their faithfulness we thank you that you continue to work through people uh, that you inspired 50 people to get up yesterday morning and come and and pick up rocks and paint and, and uh, do some demo and all of the work that was accomplished and so much more to be accomplished. Father, thank you. Thank you for the faithfulness of our missionaries that are serving around the world with a very, very difficult circumstances. Father, we pray for those that are suffering in our church family and, and in our friendships around. I, just even the word yesterday from friend for so many of uh, Debbie Palmer, we just pray that you would uh, work in her life and, and bring healing to her body. And for so many others, Father, we just pray. Thank you that, that we have a hope in spite of difficult times. And uh, we just praise you for that. Father, in this service, we pray that our lives would be impacted, our lives would be changed. We pray that you'd bless Pastor Lyle as he preaches. Um, that none of us would leave here the same as we came in and that our minds and our hearts would be focused on serving you and bringing honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and join us as we continue singing this morning? Oh, 
that we stand, but, you know, the song we're going to sing now, it's real simple, it's just the gospel, which if you're not familiar with the gospel, maybe it's the first time, it just means good news, that Christ came and he died on the cross for our sins, and he was buried and he rose again, that whoever believes would have eternal life, that's what it says in John, chapter 3, verse 16, a verse you might be really familiar with, but we're simply going to sing the, the words to that verse in this song, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes will not perish, they shall have eternal. shall hold to the cross. I shall hold to God alone, for His love has salvaged me. For His love has saved
precious blood. Sing 
a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. creation I sing praise to the King of Kings you are my everything and I will adore you of lightning, rolls of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you the only wise King. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. King of kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Filled with wonder. Struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Adore you, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We yeah. all creation I sing, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will. Adore you. Would you pray with me? God, we, we do announce our praise to you this morning. We're thankful for your sacrifice you sung a moment ago about the gospel, that you love the world so much that you gave your only son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, that's why we are here this morning. That's why we worship you. And we believe that you are the answer to everything we need in life. God, would you work in our hearts this morning through your word? We are so thankful that we can celebrate moms today. But God, all of us need to hear from you. Would you speak to our hearts through your word, through Pastor Lyle this morning? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated.
My mom is absolutely incredible. I definitely would not be who I am or where I'm at today if it wasn't for her. I'm thankful for her and that I love her more than I can express. Just everything that she's done for me is so much a part of who I am today. Call her on the phone? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I could do that. I would definitely do that. I'm going to cry so hard. <sighs> I am just really happy that you're a part of my life and that you've been a huge mentor of mine. Yeah, we couldn't have done it if it weren't for you being willing to sacrifice. I just want you to know how much I love you. I never realized how much you did and how much you juggled until I had kids of my own. I love you a lot and that I appreciate everything you've done for me in life. Thank you just for everything. So, if you haven't had that phone call with mom yet, I would encourage you to uh, hashtag call a mom. Maybe it's not your mom, maybe, maybe your mom's not, mom's not here anymore, and so you call maybe another mom, another influential uh, lady in your life who you, you share some of those sentiments that you just heard. Um, it's amazing how in our lives, for many of us, mom has been a go-to kind of person, right, for help and hope in, in times of need, crisis, or, or struggle in life. Uh, I'm sure over the course of your life, uh, many of you, you've, you've said, you know, I, I hope that mom can fix it. I hope that mom can make it feel better. I hope uh, mom will, will know what to do. And for some of you, even as adults, you still have a regular routine of calling and talking and spending life with mom. The sad truth is today... Not everybody has that resource. Um, we live in a broken world. So today, there's a lot of brokenness surrounding Mother's Day. It's a hard day for some of you today. In fact, Pastor was sharing how he had a conversation a while ago with, with someone who was just talking about this. The, the difficulty, the struggle surrounding the topic of mom, the relationship with mom, or the absence of relationship with mom. Or you are a, a mom who you remember when you, uh, where you were praying for pregnancy but lost the baby and prayed for pregnancy and lost the baby and prayed for pregnancy and lost the baby. So today I know that as we talk about uh, our subject today, as we really look at the idea of, of lean on me, that today as you contemplate that regarding mother specifically, you don't have a, a really great view of that or a comfortable like what we just saw in this video where there's this passionate relationship that's an absent thing for you and that's because of the fact that we live in a brokenness a fallen world which we talked about just last week in our uh, sermon series that we've taken a one-week break from but it'll be interesting as we see some of the connections from last week to this week because in this broken world, whether there's, there's mom or not in your world, everybody is looking for somebody or something to lean on, to put their hope in. And so today we're going to talk about this difficult tension that is a reality for us uh, of where we lean, where we put our hope as we're trying to manage our lives so today the question is, how do we stay hopeful in a hopelessly broken world? How do we stay hopeful in a hopelessly broken world? How do we keep it together when it seems like everything is falling apart? There's just pieces. Last week we talked about that brokenness, walking around, hearing the crunch of the eggshells because there's just brokenness seemingly all around us. All of us will wrestle with this at some point. It is going to be a dilemma in your life. You see, uh, you probably can think about how you have, have uh, placed your hope in someone or something in your life. And whether it's you're thinking about um, that mom relationship and the, the, the way that you leaned into, leaned onto, and you had that relationship at one point, or maybe you don't now, but there are times that moms aren't perfect. They also live in a broken uh, world, so there's going to be some times that even as you leaned into mom, 
you found that there was even some failure there, and you've got to deal with or think about or work through that. But for a lot of people, it might be um, that you have leaned into uh, the workplace environment, hoping that your job would become a career. And as you leaned into that, you found that it failed you. You're, you've misplaced your hope in that. Or maybe you've gone to the altar, and, and at the altar you made a commitment, a covenant, but now you're in a place in your life, whether you're here in person or online listening, and, and you leaned into, put your hope in something there that now is a crumbled, broken mess of a relationship. But at one point, boy, you leaned all of your weight into that. Maybe it's your wealth or your health. You're a young person listening today, and right now it's the engagement that you have. It could be academics. There could be even a, a promise of a bright, hopeful future in, in some particular academic field or athletics. or I mean, you name it, people lean into because we're all built to be desiring and wanting to hope in something or in someone. But we've all experienced how over and over again we are met with potentially what you'd describe as hopelessness, that feeling that comes with knowing that the person or thing in which you've placed your hope will not or cannot actually come through right? How do we stay hopeful in a hopelessly broken world? Some of us have gotten to the point where we're like, why do we even try? Why do we even bother? What's the point? Because the dilemma is you keep leaning in and it fails and you lean in and it disappoints. You lean in and it, it's, it's broken again. A couple thoughts on hope here as we start. Hope, thinking in as we develop this, when we get to the end, I think you're going to see very differently in this topic of hope. But as we start, I think our culture and the world will think about hope as the person or the thing in which you put your expectations, the stuff that you lean into, that you hope in, that person or thing that you've placed that confidence as it's related to your future. And you see, you probably didn't think about it when you came in today, but all of you today have these specific things in your life that you are leaning into, that you're hoping in. From the day that we were born, you don't certainly think about it with that, at that point, but you realize that as a kid, when you're born, all of a sudden, you've got to hope in some, something, someone that's going to take care of the needs that you have. But as you get older, as the disappointments or the brokenness or the things happen in your life, you start to shift what you're leaning into. And a lot of times people will start to shift and lean into themselves in some, some way. I'm going to start to figure out how to supply, how to hope or in a way, build my life in a way where it's on me. I'm going to be responsible for this area of hope. But right now and today, we all are hoping in something. That hope has probably shifted many times throughout your life when something or someone begins to be unreliable. So you choose to place it somewhere else, but it's placed somewhere this morning. Hope. It's kind of like a ladder. Leaned against the wall of something. Now, as we think about ladders leaning on hoping in something, uh, it, I, I couldn't help but, but show you a few pictures of people who used a ladder and placed their hope in some pretty ridiculous things like this guy. I mean, you've probably seen some of these, and I don't know how clear it is from the back row, uh, but man, like, when you think about that, that dude is hoping that that railing will actually keep him from severe harm or maybe even death, right? But this is, like, this is like child's play of ladder ridiculousness. Like, let's go on to the next one. Here's a few of them. Okay, so as you're looking at it, this person's like completely hoping in their buddy here. I mean, this is fairly ridiculous, right? Hoping in a friend, hoping in his footing. Like, that doesn't even make any sense looking at that middle picture. But yet, I have to say and admit I've done that before. This one over here, uh, have not done that. Have not done that, and um, I, I can't even quite understand it, uh, but as you look at those, you're thinking, wow, those guys, um, 
are hoping in some pretty unsure things. They're leaning into with their lives in some of those situations into some pretty crazy stuff. But this one to me is amazing. This is, you've probably seen this meme before. Uh, go ahead to that next one. Yeah, when your second idea seems more sketchy than your first, always choose the latter. Ah, oh, it's a great meme. That's a great meme. Uh, but man, that is... I mean, you probably can't even see the extra cabling that's in the picture, the rope that's tied off to maybe the truck out in the street. I don't even know. But the fact is, is that we lean into, we lean into these things. We put our hope in these things. And look at the things that we tend to lean into. We put our hope up against family, power, careers, wealth, our talents, and the list goes on and on, doesn't it? Like this is the life that we regularly live, and, and as you're starting to think about and evaluate, you didn't walk in here thinking about it, but boy, you've leaned in and against. You've set your ladder up against some things in your life, no doubt. Today you haven't thought about it, but you today have a ladder of hope. Something that you probably didn't think about or hadn't thought about until that particular thing started to dissipate, started to disintegrate, started to erode, started to disappoint you, started to let you down in some way. Like the guy realizes when he's up there changing the light that all of a sudden maybe that banister starts to lean in a little bit with him. And boy, that would be that moment that all of a sudden, as that, that hope in that thing starts to dissipate, you realize you've just put your hope in something that's futile. When that thing starts to evaporate, we realize our hope is a little bit like air. We begin to gasp for hope when we can't breathe the air of the thing that we just had our hope in. Does that make sense? In other words, uh, a few years, well, a lot of years ago now, Beck and I had the privilege of doing some snorkeling, uh, and we were in Hawaii on Oahu, and we were at a location called Shark's Cove. Now, it's an amazing thing because you're like, you were snorkeling in Shark's Cove. Doesn't, it's kind of like the ladder people. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, bud. All right? But I think, they, I think they called it that to keep the tourists away because there were no sharks. It was genius. Call it Shark's Cove, but there's fish and, and turtles. and right? It was awesome. But uh, I shared a while ago about when I almost drowned in Virginia Beach and the Lord, uh, by his grace, uh, and in Pollywog uh, YMCA swimming lessons got me to the point where I didn't fear the water anymore. And now as an adult, I'm with my wife, we're snorkeling out in Shark's Cove. Like that was, that was uh, 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 a future I could have never imagined when I was a teenager. But if you've ever snorkeled before, you know that as you're, you're floating there and you're breathing through this tube, right, you're getting some air. It's a little weird at first, but then after a while, you get pretty comfortable. You're floating around, but then you, you realize, all right, now the next level is diving down lower in the water so that you can see more, hang out with. There's that Netflix thing about the octopus. It's kind of like that. You're down there like analyzing the oct Mr. Octopus, my friend the octopus or whatever, that my teacher the octopus, is that what it is? Dave's all up on these cool octopus stories. Um, so... I breathe out the air so that I am now not buoyant. Now I'm less buoyant. I'm sinking down low, right? And you're down there for a while. And after you do that a while, and you're like, you, you can go down a little bit and a little bit more, a little bit more. I'm watching other people. I can see people in the water. They're like 20 feet below me. And I'm like, what? But after a while, you go a little deeper and you go a little deeper, right? And you exhale the air out. So now you're down at whatever depth you are. But you got to get all the way back up to the top. And you're at that point where all the air is exhaled. So... There's that moment of panic on your way back up. Maybe you've experienced that. And it's like, at that time, I'm underwater. I need air, but I am hopeless for air, powerless for air, because I have no ability at that moment to actually breathe air while I'm underwater. 
We faced that in these moments when we lean our ladders against things that start to dissipate, start to erode, and all of a sudden, when it happens, we all of a sudden gasp for air, for hope, and we don't have it, and we realize we're in a really bad spot. We're powerless, maybe even hopeless in that moment, in that thing, because we've leaned into things that God doesn't intend us to lean our hope into. The leading causes of suicide center around an overwhelming sense of hopelessness, both relationally and financially. People who are underwater like they need desperate air and they can't get free. They can't find the air that they need and they feel helpless, hopeless, and powerless. But see, we're in church, and you would expect today that the answer that I'm going to talk about, that I'm going to give you, is that throughout all the pages of Scripture, we know that we're told to put our hope in God. Look at Psalms 33, verse 22. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord. For our hope is in God. You alone. The only way to maintain hope in a broken world is to place our hope completely, entirely on God. But as a nation, we struggle with this. As a culture, we struggle with this. People who have no relationship, don't know God, don't, don't care to know God, they really struggle with it. When you see them go after, they will go after um, a, a lifestyle of exercise or even drugs and surgery, trying to prolong the inevitable. Even education or some of these things that they, they put all this future hope in, trying to delay, feeling like I'm kind of untouchable at this point in my life. Have you met those kind of people? They've leaned their ladder so much in that place, and then they spend the rest of their life trying to keep it there, even though as time goes on, they realize those are eroding walls, eroding walls, broken walls. They're they're disintegrating, but they will put all their time, effort, energy, resources into trying to hold their ladder against these walls. But ultimately, ultimately, in the end, those are hopeless walls. It doesn't work, ultimately. Why? Because ultimately, the world is broken. Broken way more than we know. We were looking at this just last week. Now, the the Bible addresses this head-on in many different passages. And last week, I alluded to a passage, Romans chapter 8. And we're going to look in Romans chapter 8 here today for a couple minutes, where Paul gives us some very valuable insight into this area of hopelessness versus hope. This this disintegrating, broken uh, uh, world versus complete, utter, surrounded by the hope that we can have in God. Romans chapter 8, some of this I'm going to paraphrase, some I'm going to highlight, some of it I'm going to dig into as we go through, but he begins and talks early in the chapter about when sin entered the world, the fall. That's where we were last week in Epic, sermon, our sermon series of Epic week two, we talked about the fall last week, the day that the world changed Where Satan deceived Eve, she began to doubt God in his word, doubt God in his goodness, doubt God in his character. She decided to, she was convinced by this deceptive serpent who was being controlled by Satan, the one who came to steal, kill, and destroy. He started there in the garden, and they chose to go after that which God said, if you do, you will die. Surely you will die. Ah, did God really say. But she's convinced, and they, they... They take a hold of what God said, don't. Sin, sin entered the world. Paul says, in death by sin, death passed to all men, for all have sinned. Sometimes we think and look at sin as this moment-by-moment decision or choice or situation, that it's this isolated incident or act. But sin is a disease as it's described. That it's not just infected but affected all of us in all of creation we just touched on it last week but have you noticed that everything that has life dies 
the world in which we live, and it's not different today than it was 1,000, 2,000 years ago, the problem, the disease of sin existed then. It's existed since the garden. But you can look and open your eyes and your ears and very quickly see the perverseness, the depravity of the effects of sin on our world. Eggshells crunching under our feet every step that we take. Broken. Pieces that can't be put together like an egg. But in verse 20 of Romans chapter 8, it says, Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. Another version says frustration. That the earth, when the sin entered the world, that in, when you go back to Genesis chapter 3 where we were last week, you see how there was specific uh, a frustration or curse put on man and woman and earth and serpent, the devil. They were all had their, their curses that were put on. It was this disease of sin taking over. And we still live with those effects in us and around us uh, today as well as the earth. All things are broken. All things are affected by this. Against its will, creation was subject to this curse. Okay? Frustrated. Frustrated in our lives with the, the, the fact that we go after and we desire and we can't achieve and we can't uh, obtain. There's this disappointment that's just intertwined in the fabric of all of human life. And that is normal today. But remember, that's not what God created. God created that what was good and man and woman, very good. But today, normal is not good, right? Because sin came in and broke it all down. Decay and sin is being allowed to run its course. And people spend a lot of time and energy trying to slow that course down. But we see in the end of verse 20, but with eager hope, verse 21, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. So what it's saying is that all things in this world are subject to death and decay. But yet, for some reason, we keep thinking that we can lean our ladder of hope on all of these things that we know are going to break down have broken down, are in the process of breaking down, one day it's going to be broken. So in a way, it's kind of like the pictures of the people with the ladders. What in the world are we doing? Like, if you've ever had that moment, I mean, I've had way more than I care to share of the ridiculous trying to lean my ladder in the awkward positions and at too tall, and it's, it's, it's uh, foolishness, total foolishness. Some of you don't understand that at all. You're scared of heights to the point you're like, I first rung in the ladder, not even for me, right? But the truth is, is that I have in my life chosen to lean my, I've chose to lean my ladder against things that I know with fact are going to decay, erode. It's a pretty bad idea to attach our hope to anything in this world then because it's all decaying. There's nothing that's really as stable as we think it is. Think about it. Paul himself, I mean, if there was any, some, any humans that lived out there that should have been given some pass from this decay, some pass, like their life was so unbelievably amazing, shouldn't God have given them a pass? Paul died. Peter, James, and John died. Jonathan Edwards decayed. George Whitfield, Spurgeon, Moody I mean, even Mother Teresa died in 1997. If there was ever a human on Mother's Day that we could say, wow, look at what they did. Sin's effect was not passed by. Things are breaking down, decaying. It's why all of us who might be control freaks, which I, I said us, but I'm really not one of them. All of us control freaks are, always can be so frustrated the world just won't cooperate with my plans. Things break. People misbehave. My children aren't interested in the plans that I have for them. And then the kids are like, yeah, and my parents won't pay for all my bad ideas. Right? It's hopeless, this world. Verse 22, for we know that all creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to present time. He talks about, Childbirth, the same that when 
God in Genesis chapter 3 tells Eve, like, there's going to be, there, there's a part of this curse is your cur- curse in childbirth. That the world is also groaning in pain constantly, like what we think of the mother connected to childbirth. You see, I've always thought about that in the, in the, and I've experienced two babies being born from a distance, right? Have no clue, have no clue what it's actually like to go through. But I watched it twice, and I always think about the passages that talk about this childbirth, specifically pertaining just to the moment or that, that 24, 48, however long it ends up taking, that time that is really, really awful. The pain, the groaning of childbirth. But that's just the little bit after the beginning of the process and right at the starting gate of the entire lifetime process of being a mom. In moms, is there not pain, quite frankly, along the entire road? That all of life has got certainly mountaintops, but plenty of valleys. The mom reality is, today some of you, as I said earlier, have hoped to get pregnant again and again. Then just talked to a young lady in town that we're friends with, 21 weeks pregnant. She's hoping she doesn't gain too much weight. Good luck with that. (laughs) Hope for Natural birth, hope that the epidural will work so great I don't feel anything. Hope that their husband won't be too embarrassing during the delivery. Hope that their mom can come for a while while the husband might be hoping differently. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. It's not his plan anyway. Uh, And you skip ahead a little bit, and they hope that those kids don't get sick, the kids don't get hurt, that they'll meet the right person, choose the right path for their life. And quite frankly, moms never stop hoping for their kids. But even superhero moms... Don't hope that their kids hope in them. They want them to hope in God. Pastor mentioned Deb Palmer earlier. She means a lot to a lot of us that, that know their family. And um, as I was thinking last night, because we got a text, and then we were messaging with uh, Tiffany and with Adam. Adam uh, I coached Adam when I was coaching at the Bible Institute, her son. At that moment, relationship with mom was um, rocky at best. I got a call during the Bible Institute break during Christmas from Adam's mom, Deb, who we're praying for this morning. And, I mean, she was beside herself trying to figure out what to do with this kid, you know, 19-year-old and, and uh, just trying to figure out his way through life, hoping, hoping that somehow God would get a hold of this dude's life. Well, a couple days later, Adam is calling me saying, dude, I'm hoping that you can do something for my mom because she's crazy. She just took the door off my bedroom because she won't trust me. And I'm like, what did you do? All right, well, you, she shouldn't trust you. And today, all these years later, there's a dude that was texting with us about his mom last night. God's gotten a hold of his life. She never stopped hoping for him, but she didn't hope that he hoped in her. She really hoped that he would hope in God. There's a son who has a relationship with his mom that hasn't always been perfect because the world's broken. It's a frustration that creates a longing inside of us, this broken downness that happens in the world because of sin. We long, and people long who don't understand it, they long for something bigger, something better, something that they can really rest assured in that their hope is not going to eventually let them down. Something beyond this life, something that would, would save them, would rescue them, in essence, from this penalty, this problem, this decay, all the effects of sin. Verse 23 says, and we believers also groan. We long for our bodies to be released from this sin and suffering. Don't we, church? Don't we long for that? Long to not have to pray that, that somehow God would work a miracle, that something would happen that would change Deb's white blood cell count and give her lo- a longer life to live? How many of those kind of prayers have you prayed this month for people who are sitting here right now and listening online this morning? 
yet we also groan. We wait for the day when we'll be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope, eager hope, in the day when God will give us the full rights of his adopted children, including new bodies as he has promised. That will be amazing. That will be awesome. We hope right now for Deb's healing, for Jill Riley's healing, for others that we pray for often, for Chuck McKenna to get lungs finally. I mean, how many times are they going to go through and be disappointed and then, oh, hopefully, but disappointed? You're leaning your ladder against a wall that's built on decay. Verse 24, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Now, why didn't he say it, but if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we hope for it? He didn't describe it as that, did he? He said, if we don't have that something, we look forward to that something we don't yet have, we wait patiently and confidently. This is a completely different type of hope than what we've been talking about leaning our ladders against. Because this is saying there is a present confidence of a future reality. It is guaranteed inheritance. You know what an inheritance is. You hope that one day maybe you'll get it if the government doesn't take it all, right? Whatever whatever your thoughts is, whatever your thoughts is. This is guaranteed inheritance. It's a sure thing, 100%. God said so. Remember Eve? Did God really say? No, she learned her lesson. Don't doubt God. Sin comes in the world, and now we're dealing with the effects of all of that, but we have a hope that is a sure thing, present reality, present confidence of a future reality. Excuse me. Guaranteed inheritance. You see, we're tied to a bigger story than all of our lives. Tied to our, our, our lives are tied to a bigger uh, story than this one little life that we live in. And when we became Christians, we knew that this life wasn't what it was all about. There was a future hope to lean into. And we wait patiently and confidently for it. We don't give up hope in this area. We wait See, verses 26 through 30, just paraphrasing, God is working now. In this life, we might find ourselves frustrated. We might find ourselves uh, 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 just struggling through this decaying, broken world. And God understands. He hears our prayers even at our weakest moments. He's hearing our prayers even if they're just groans of frustration and mourning and agony. But even still, he is working toward our good and his glory. And then look at verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who could be against us? Maybe our paradigm needs to shift a little bit that as we are thinking about these temporary hopes that we place our ladder against, that in a way we're like, oh, we're leaning our ladder against this. But in, it's kind of like you're leaning against something that isn't really for you. It's broken down and quite frankly against you. So you ever have that moment where you set your ladder up, it's a little bit too steep and you start to climb and actually, oh, look at where you go. You never experienced that? Okay, another dumb Lyle moment with a ladder, okay? It's not for you. It's against you. You think you're leaning your ladder into something, but what this verse is saying is that what should we say then in response to these unbelievable things about God working, understanding that we live in this broken world, and yet he is working towards your good for his glory. He is for you, not against you. It means that You've chosen to move your ladder. You've moved your ladder. You see, all of a sudden, instead of continuing to put your hope in, put your hope in, put your hope in, let down, disappointment, 
hopeless, powerless, frustrated, can't get my air, I can't get breath, I need something else to hope in. How many people go through life like that? It's like the, this roller coaster of ups and downs. Why don't you move your ladder to something that is a sure thing to put your hope in? Move your ladder. Because verse 38 says, I'm convinced that nothing, absolutely nothing, can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the power of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that has been revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is telling us that we can move our ladder against a sure thing of the unfailing love of Christ. Amen. Because we have put our, our hope in, our hope in, our hope in, our hope in, and we know that road. We know the disappointments. We know how exhausting, how tiring. But he's saying we can move our ladder. We can move our ladder. We can put it against the sure for us, not against us, unfailing, unfailing love of Christ. Romans 8, 38 and 39. You see, what he's describing is not a love that comes that we're feeling this hope that comes because, oh, we got the call back from a job. We got the, a career promotion. Uh, our investments made more money. My kids did what I asked them to do for once. Um, you know, my relationship's looking up. Um, you know, I, you, you, there's so many things, right, that we, we feel this temporary hope. And what this is describing is that, that love was demonstrated to us completely uh, expecting nothing in return. We did nothing for it. We can do nothing to lose it. It's not earned. That love that's described that we can put our hope and put our ladder against was demonstrated in history when God's son died for your sin and for mine and secured your spot in the family of God, guaranteed inheritance something that cannot be broken no matter what circumstances you're facing today, what situations happen in the future, you can lean your ladder assured. I can hope in something that will never, ever erode, change, or be broken. Today, I hope that you discover where you're actually leaning on or what you're actually leaning on. Because today you will either choose to move your ladder or lose your hope. I hope, I hope for your sake that you take a, a actual inventory, actual accountability. As I think about it, Lyle, yeah, you know what? I don't really hope in God at all. I kind of hope in all the stuff, all the circumstances, all the things that I feel like I can control. You realize, like, one day you will be hopeless because we know that it all turns to dust. What or whom you are hoping in determines your ability to maintain hope in a broken world. What or whom you're hoping in determines your ability to maintain hope in a broken world. And today I'm inviting you to lean your hope against God's unending love for you. It's an amazing thing that happens, and you've got this death grip on the ladder, and it's, I'm hoping in my career, I'm hoping in my finance, I'm hoping in my health, I'm hoping and I'm doing everything I possibly can do, and you've got this death grip on the ladder. I'm going to make this work. I don't even know what you're talking about, Lyle. Move my ladder. As we go through life, more empty-handed. God, your plan, your path, your will, what you would have for me. I don't want to lean on my own understanding it's another wall that we lean on, but I want to lean on you, your ways. You will then, as I acknowledge you in every area of my life, you will start to direct my paths. You start to go through life where you don't have this death grip on the ladder. You become open-handed. And amazing is you become open-handed with your ambitions, your plans, your treasures, 
You begin to be open-handed. All of a sudden, you have the ability, as you let go, oh, now you can actually move that ladder. The problem is, is that we have such a death grip on our plans, our control, our, our, our ambitions, hopes, plans, ambitions, those things that, that, that drive you every day right now. God, what would you have for me? And take that ladder from that wall that's decaying, eroding, and going to leave you hopeless, powerless, and helpless, and lean it against the unfailing love of God. The verse we started with, Psalms 33, 22, may your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Where are you leaning your ladder today? This is a conversation I feel like is pretty regular for Pastor and I and the other counselors here. Disappointment, hurt, brokenness, sadness, because the thing that they're hoping in somehow eroded and gave up, quit, backstabbed, walked away, whatever it is. I invite you today, say, okay, God, I've tried my own way. I will let go of the ladder and allow you to move it. And now start a new life where all of a sudden, no matter what the circumstance, no matter who lets you down, whether you have a, a uh, hard relationship with mom today or no relationship with mom today, your hope isn't there. It's in something that will never, ever fail you, leave you. It's for you, not against you. It's the unfailing love of Jesus Christ. Lean your ladder. Lean on him today. Would you pray with me? Father God, I pray on this Mother's Day that all of us would choose not to lean on any one particular person or th thing, but that we would wholeheartedly lean our hope completely in and on you today. May we put our faith, our trust, our hope completely in the person of Jesus who gave everything for us so that we would have a hope and a future while living this short, tiny, fleeting life in this, this, this time that... Uh, uh, is so small compared to eternity. God, help us to, to, to gather that today, to, to wrestle through that today, that you desire us to have this, uh, this, this eternal uh, relationship, this uh, inheritance that is guaranteed to be a part of your family, adopted in as sons and daughters. May we find our hope and rest truly in you today only surround us, encompass us, comfort us with your unfailing love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and join us as we close worshiping.
now, nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, moms, uh, it has been a privilege to have you spend the morning of your Mother's Day with us. And uh, so we hope that if there's anything we can do for you, do for you. Folks are joining us online as well. Please let us know before you go. Um, this week, uh, I've gone back and forth, and my wife just gave me advice, and I listen to my wife's advice. So, yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Debbie, I love you. Um. So a year ago, we were in this weird time where we were online, mom, mom's church, and, and we didn't tell anybody we did it, but we, we went to the coffee shop in town and said, hey, whatever moms come in uh, for the week, just, just pick up their coffee on Mountainside. It was kind of just this secret thing that happened. And so I was kind of planning to do the same thing, and, uh, and I was just advised that maybe I should let the cat out of the bag a little bit, that starting tomorrow uh, at the coffee shop, moms, if you go, moms who are online, if you go in, until the money runs dry, uh, your drink will be covered uh, as a gift from Mountainside, and, uh, and maybe take uh, your, your moms from the community who are not a part of our church family, who aren't believers, take them and let the church buy them a coffee as well as a gift from us to them, because that's a big part of our hope is that uh, the random mom will just wander in and find out that the church loved them enough to buy them a coffee even though we don't know them. And so uh, let's use that as a platform uh, uh, to be able to preach the love of God to them as well. Uh, there's a couples event next Saturday night, and uh, there is a sign-up for that that is available. You can sign up today. That would be amazing. Just commit. Just wives, just say, husband, you're coming. Write your name down, and then we can heckle you all week long to make you guilty about not coming and being a part of our, our couples night. Okay? Just kidding about the heckling part and the guilt part. That'll be God's work in your life over the week as to whether you show up next Saturday. But we'd love to come together next Saturday. Please sign up. You can also go to the events page on the website, and you'll see the event there. You can click on it and sign up there as well. Uh, God bless you. We love you. We're so thankful for you. Uh, rest. Lean into him for your hope this week. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. There's no way.